Thank you, uh, Ryan and Leslie and Yoon for uh, great music. And uh, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we had a great time of worship earlier on, and uh, we look forward to hearing from our brother uh, John Tillery this morning uh, at the uh, close of the uh, worship time. Uh, just some announcements that uh, maybe we can all uh, remember. We'll uh, continue with the uh, online communion and the Right Now Media uh, worship service uh, when we're uh, meeting on the next couple of weeks. And uh, we don't see before the start of May that we will have any other opportunity to uh, meet uh, otherwise. Uh, we would really uh, encourage you to continue to uh, meet with your small group uh, online, as some of you have done already, and uh, maybe some of you can uh, do that, uh, uh, get some innovative uh, ways to uh, approach uh, keeping your small group together. Uh, we do need to pray for our, our leaders of our country, leaders of our state and our city, and we also need to pray for the elders of our church. All have difficult decisions to make over the next uh, few days and weeks, and uh, we ask your, your prayer on their behalf uh, for all of these things. Another thing that uh, we could uh, really profit from, I think, is if you would let the elders know of any uh, special needs that people might have, uh, in our fellowship, and we, uh, it's hard to keep up with everybody, and so we're uh, making this appeal just to uh, keep us informed of uh, those things. And so we'll uh, continue now with our, our music and look forward to the uh, sermon from uh, Brother John. Shall we pray? Father, we... Uh, come this morning and raise these things up to you that we've been mentioning. Uh, we pray for care for our church. We pray for, pray for the individual members of it, that uh, some who may be uh, uh, hurting or out of work or whatever, Lord, we, we just ask your help. And we pray for the leaders of our country and our state and our uh, city where we know we need uh, divine guidance, and we ask your help in doing that. So uh, we really uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity that uh, the media gives us to be able to uh, meet together and those who have worked so hard to put this together, and we ask that you would uh, bless the effort, and we commit it to you now in our Savior's name. Amen.
Father, you indeed are worthy. You are the only one who not simply mandates our praise, but you deserve our praise. You are worthy of our praise. We're not even in a position where we can question whether we praise you or not. For no one else in the universe is like you. You are worthy. You are holy. You are glorious. You are the Lord God of creation. You're the one who loves us. Your son gave his life for us that we might live an abundant life here and an eternal life with you in glory. He is risen. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Today we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is worthy of our praise, our adoration, and our worship. May you be blessed. In 1987, we graduated from seminary, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. I say we because while I earned a Master of Theology, my, my wife earned a Ph.T., put hubby through. Unfortunately, we still owed money to the seminary, and so when I walked across the stage, I received a beautiful presentation folder, which had absolutely nothing in it except for a small slip that said, see the business office. <laughs> and so it didn't ruin my day, not at all. Seminary was a Herculean effort, and we crammed four years into six. I worked full time. We raised three children. We kept a happy marriage. We were thrilled, but still a little sad. One of my friends from the Arab Church of Dallas, where I was the assistant pastor, said, let me see it. Let me see it. And I put him off. So later he asked uh, another friend from the church, what's up with John? Why didn't he let me see his certificate? My friend said it's because he doesn't have one. <laughs> He still owes about $750. That was an enormous amount at the time. The next day, the Arab church had a graduation party for all the graduates who, from high school and seminary and college uh, that attended there. And uh, I mad, a dear friend, called Barbara and me up to the front. And he said some very, very lovely words. He, did, he knew that I didn't have the graduation certificate. And then he said, on behalf of the believers here, I present you with this certificate. And he handed me his uh, Dallas Theological Seminary presentation folder. And I thought, well, how about that? Someone has gone through the trouble to create a little certificate for Barbara and I so that we wouldn't feel too badly. However, when I opened it, it was a graduation certificate. And it had my name on it. It, it. it was a real copy. And, and I said, how in the world did you get my name on a copy of a certificate? And he said, John, Barb, it's not a copy. We took up a collection and we picked it up from school this afternoon. Well, Barbara and I both began to cry. Soon everyone there was crying. One woman who had escaped Saddam Hussein's reign of terror and was known not to cry, was asked by one of the men, why are you crying? She said, stone would cry. Has anything altogether unexpected ever happened to you? Have you ever been deeply and profoundly sad inside one moment and filled with joy in an instant? That was the case with the Apostle John. Two weeks ago, we saw in Revelation 4 that John was caught up into the presence of God in heaven, seated on his throne and surrounded by the angelic creatures and the elders, heaven's court. 
Revelation chapter 5 is still in heaven, but the theme moves from the worship of God seated on his throne to the worship of Christ, the full-throated worship of our Redeemer, Christ the Lord. In Revelation 5, John's gaze was still on the throne, but he saw a strange sight. He says there that then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look in it. I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Before we look at the scroll, let's look at John's reaction. John heard the mighty angel proclaim to the whole universe and call out, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? If anyone can open the scroll, in essence, come forward. Let's see. That's the question that is at the basis for all human enterprise. Who is worthy? Who can solve the problems that have been here for centuries? Who's smart enough? Who's worthy enough? Who is enough? And there have been many who have tried. Nebuchadnezzar, he boasted about how cleverly he had created his uh, kingdom centered in Babylon, but that soon fell apart. Alexander the Great thought he had done it when at the age of 32... He cried because he didn't have any more nations to conquer. But a few months later, he drank himself to death and his empire was gone. Julius Caesar, Caesar led the legions of Rome across the face of Europe trying to establish a world in which Pax Romana reigned. But that too failed. All have failed and all have failed dismally. I mean, that's really a part of J.R.R. Tolkien's story about redemption in The Lord of the Rings. Even the innocent hobbit was not worthy. That was his point. We revere men like George Washington, but he was not able to bring peace in the world. We think about men like Abraham Lincoln, his heart filled with compassion for both North and South. But he wasn't able to solve any of the problems of humanity. And so it is no wonder that we read in the text that John wept, Eklion palu. That Greek phrase doesn't mean the same thing that we say in English when we use the word weep. John was not weeping. John was not weeping quietly in the corner. He was wailing. He was crying loudly. He was, it was so uncomfortable for us to hear these words that the translators use the word weep when what they really should use is the word wail. Keep it in, we're told in the West. Control yourself. You're embarrassing yourself. You're family. Stop it. Stop it or I'll give you something to cry about. You know, we weren't always this closed off emotionally. We were children once, and that's what you need to think about in terms of the unself-conscious expression of John looking at the throne, seeing the scroll, knowing that it represents nothing but judgment and pain and sorrow, and he is fully broken in his spirit. We just don't like that. We don't like wailing. Weeping is so much more sophisticated. But why shouldn't he wail? I mean, all he saw was doom. That was the only pathway forward. The righteous anger and justice of God would fall on everyone. But he was wrong. For just then, John is let in 
on what everyone in heaven already knew. The Lion of Judah approaches. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. The Lion of Judah, the Root of David. Both these phrases refer to Old Testament prophecies that tell there would come a time when a person, when one from the tribe of Judah, from the family of David, would at last rule over the earth. These titles refer to the king of the Jews. I mean, even Pilate got it. He inscribed on the cross of Jesus uh, something that could not be changed, the king of the Jews. He is the one who triumphs and can bring about God's kingdom on earth. But now I want you to listen very, very carefully. When John turned to see the majesty of the conquering Lion of Judah, what did he see? He saw a lamb. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. John expected to see the Lion of Judah, but what he saw was a lamb with the marks of death still upon it. I mean, from this text, it appears that the marks of Christ's supreme sacrifice will always be evident in heaven. The scars of Calvary, that our living Savior bears are not simply evidence that our sin's debt has been paid, but it's also evidence of his compassion, and his sacrificial love for us. In 1924, B.B. McKinney wrote the hymn, Put Your Hand in the Nail-Scarred Hand. So to place your hand in the nail-scarred hand means that what you're doing is you're giving all of your fret and anxiety and trouble and care to him. It's to trust his compassion and to appropriate his grace and mercy. The words, very touching. Have you failed in your plan of your storm-tossed life? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand? Are you weary and worn from its toil and strife? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Are you walking alone through the shadows dim? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Christ will comfort your heart. Put your trust in him. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Is your soul burdened down with its load of sin? Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. Throw your heart open wide. Let the Savior in. Place your hand in the nail-scarred hand. The marks of death are still upon the Lamb and will be for all eternity. And in those two symbols, the Lion of Judah and the Lamb that was slain, the Lord, through his revelation to John, shows what had never been seen nor understood the uniting of the two themes that run all the way through the Bible. And that is this, lions conquer, lambs submit, lions roar, lambs die. Lions are symbols of majesty and power and rule and authority. Lambs are sacrificial animals. They represent purity and innocence and gentleness. And yet here we see for the first time the two combined showing that the Lion of Judah is the Lamb who was slain, the one who made promises to Israel and the heavenly calling of the believers. Now those Jewish elements are not simply metaphors, which many take them to be, metaphors for the church. No, the Lord takes his church from this earth in the rapture into glory. And when that happens, Israel will once again come to the center of God's redemption story. When this scroll 
begins to open, God will call Israel back to the ultimate fulfillment of promises that they had long held, but they had never realized. The time has come. The restoration of Israel is upon us. And as the prophets foretold, and as John saw in his vision, this uniting of the lion and the lamb is the very basis of our salvation. It's also the basis for C.S. Lewis novels, The Chronicles of Narnia. The great lion, Aslan, rules in majesty. Still, he only does so because he submitted to being put to death by the white witch. But at last, the kingdom of Narnia is freed from its bondage to winter, and the arrival of springtime has come. Now John, as he's looking at this lamb, he notes something about it. It has seven horns. In Scripture, horns speak of power. Seven is the number of completeness. So the lamb is the perfection of power on the basis of his death. Jesus himself declared this after the resurrection, when in Matthew 28, 18, he says this, Do not let this pass. All power in heaven and on earth is given to me. There were also these seven eyes that John saw, and these seven eyes are reflective of the seven spirits that we looked at earlier, which was a symbol of the Holy Spirit of God. And the first, it also speaks of his omniscience. In the first chapter of John's Gospel, it is said of Jesus that he does not need that any should tell him about man because he knew what was in man. Jesus is divine. Jesus is human. He humbled himself and became a man, and as a man, he died for our sins. He, therefore, is the one worthy of taking the scroll and breaking the seals. So what is this scroll? Um, it's not a book as we understand it. It doesn't have pages. It's a, it's a parchment. It's, it, it's, rolled, it's rolled up, and it has seven seals on the end so that as you unroll it, you break each one of these seals as it, roll, as it rolls open. And we're... we're Ask the question, who can open it? And why is it written on the front and the back? Very rarely in antiquity were scrolls written front and back. They were hammered out on one side for writing, and the other was left to protect the writing. But in this case, it was on the front and the back, which represents the importance of this message, that the scroll wouldn't become unstitched, that the scroll itself contained the complete message from God. John tells us that that as this is written, the full message of this cannot be separated. And I want you to think about this as well. The fact that it was written in heaven means that it's unbreakable. God had written it. There's no possibility of changing it. Now, I'm reminded, perhaps you are too, of the words spoken by Yul Brenner as he played the role of Pharaoh in the Ten Commandments. So let it be written, so let it be done. Now those words are not found in the Bible, but the meaning, the concept most certainly is. When Pilate wrote what he said, the king of the Jews, he said this, what is written is written. It cannot be changed. Nothing can change it. Now it's at this point that the scene in heaven is electrified. His eyes, John's, still wet with tears, sees Jesus, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb that was slain, step up to the throne, take the scroll from the hand of God. And when this happens, listen to what the scripture says, and when he had taken the scroll, 
the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is the worship of heaven. All there, un all there in heaven understood the meaning of history and the solution that was part of God's redemptive plan. And the Lamb is at the center of their worship. Not only will all the creatures in the universe praise God and join in worship before his redemptive love, but creation itself, the rocks, the trees, the mountains, the hills, the seas, the universe itself will harmonize in praise to God. I mean, many of the Psalms reflect this right here in this text. In 1985, Barbara and I went to a Sandy Patty and Larnell Harris concert in Dallas, Texas, where they introduced the song, I've Just Seen Jesus. The words go like this. We knew he was dead. It is finished, he said. We had watched as his life ebbed away. Then we all stood around till the guards took him down. Joseph begged for his body that day. It was late afternoon when we got to the tomb, wrapped his body and sealed up the grave. So I know how you feel. His death was so real, but please listen and hear what I say. It was his voice she first heard those kind, gentle words asking what was her reason for tears, and I sobbed in, my, in despair. My Lord is not there. He said, child, it is I. I am here. I've just seen Jesus. I tell you, he is alive. I've just seen Jesus, our precious Lord, alive. And I knew he really saw me too. As if till now I'd never lived, all that I'd done before won't matter anymore. I've just seen Jesus, and I'll never be the same again. And without will, without forethought, without self-consciousness, I stood to my feet as one with the audience as we were ushered into the presence of Christ in a way I'd never experienced before. Perhaps you've had that kind of experience. It is only a taste of what we'll see. I want you to think about this. In our belief that the church will be in glory before these seals are opened, think about this. You and I will witness the moment that John was transported to yet in the future. Time, and we will stand with the elders. We will stand with the creatures around the throne and give glory to his name when he steps up and he takes the scroll from his father. This is the reason of worship in heaven. It is God bringing Jesus into his rightful place in the universe. The word says, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. This scene is the basis for Handel's Messiah 
the closing choruses. It closes with one of the most beautiful musical arrangements ever written. Worthy is the Lamb. And at the end of it, everyone in the chorus joins in worship. Amen. 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 Because Christ was obedient unto death, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is the worship of the entire universe. When Barbara and I looked into that presentation folder, I was humbled, brought to tears. But that is not to be compared with the day that I came to believe in God. And yet that day of belief for me was much like the day that John had in heaven. All I saw was an angry God and all I saw was his wrath to be laid upon me. But as I focused on the scene, I saw another. As I looked at the fearful throne of God, I saw a Savior standing there, a lamb who had sacrificed his life for me and you. Won't you come to him today? this day that we celebrate his resurrection. Today you can meet him with mercy and compassion. Let it be in forgiveness and not in wrath that you finally come to know who he truly is. Father, we give you thanks today. We stand in gratitude, appreciation. I don't even come to words that approach it. But nevertheless, we are humbled because we know that we are loved. We know that your son gave his life for us. And we know that one day, one day, he will greet us with, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I cannot even imagine that from the throne. We stand in awe before you. We thank you. We give you praise through Christ our Lord. Amen.
gentle words Asking what was her reason for tears 